You have issues on the border, issues with migration, issues with the national debt, more than 33 trillion dollars. You have nothing better to do, so you should fight in Ukraine? Wouldn't it be better to negotiate with Russia, make an agreement, already understanding the situation that is developing today, realizing that Russia will fight for its interests to the end? How's everybody doing? My name is Anthony Brian Logan, and today I bring you a recap, a review, a breakdown of the Tucker Carlson Vladimir Putin interview that was held at the Kremlin and has been released to the general public. It's on Twitter, it's on YouTube, it's on Tucker's website, it's everywhere. And as of right now, this interview has gotten hundreds of millions of views on Twitter, well into the millions on YouTube. This is probably going to be one of the most popular interviews of the year, maybe even of all time. Now, the mainstream media don't like this too much. They're talking about Tucker Carlson is a, a propagandist and he's letting Vladimir Putin lie and he's a puppet, all this, that, and the third. But really, Tucker Carlson, from my point of view and of the view of thinking people, he is simply giving an outlet to someone to express themselves, which is what journalists should do. And he's going to ask questions, hard-hitting questions. This is not a softball interview. It was one of these loving interviews that, Zelensky gets the Ukrainian president is not one of those where it's like he's wearing this sweatshirt. He might as well be wearing a teddy bear with a heart on it, essentially, because that's how much the leftist media loves Zelensky and they treat him like a child. This interview was not that. It was fair. It was stern when it needed to be. He asked hard hitting questions. It was an amazing interview. Now, if you want to see the full thing, I will link to it in the box. It's about two hours long. And yes, I did watch the entire thing. Obviously, I can't put it right here in this video. We're going to get to a few clips and analyze them. But first things first, I want you to see what Hillary Clinton had to say. Yes, that Hillary Clinton, because her opinion is kind of what the mainstream media is saying. She's just an embodiment of their particular point of view. So let's go ahead and watch this. Then we're going to see a few more. And of course, I will link to all these clips in the box. If you're an IG, visit the link in the bio. Go to the corresponding article on the website. I mean, he's like a puppy dog. You know, he somehow has, after having been fired from so many outlets in the United States, he, uh, I would not be surprised uh, if he emerges with a contract with an outlet because he is a useful idiot. He says things that are not true. He parrots Vladimir Putin's uh, pack of lies about Ukraine. Uh, so I don't see why Putin wouldn't give him an interview because now let's pause right there. I'm not going to play that entire thing. Basically, she's saying that um, Tucker Carlson is just a puppet and he's letting Vladimir Putin lie. But look, I have seen plenty of U.S. politicians and foreign politicians, Zelensky, get on TV and lie. And as a matter of fact, I've seen some guys in public office, Anthony Fauci, get on TV, lie, then come back on TV and tell you why they lie and justify it. I've seen that over and over again. So it's up to us, the viewer, to believe Putin or not believe Putin. We can fact check him. We could do our own independent research. We don't need Hillary Clinton or MS-13 DNC or the federal government, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris. We don't need them to tell us what we should and should not be hearing. Let us hear from Putin. Let us hear from Zelensky and let us make our own mind up. We're going to get to a few more things. Uh, for the first half hour or so, there was a history lesson about Kiev and Russ and Ukraine and Russia and how really they're the same people, but there's been a purposeful decision to make them be different through artificial means. Let's watch this. At some point when Russia received them as an outcome of the Russo-Turkish wars, they were called New Russia or Novorossiya. But that does not matter. What matters is that Lenin, the founder of the Soviet state, established Ukraine that way. For decades, the Ukrainian Soviet Republic developed as part of the USSR. And for unknown reasons, again, the Bolsheviks were engaged in Ukrainianization. It was not merely because the Soviet leadership was composed to a great extent of those originating from Ukraine. Rather, it was explained by the general policy of indigenous 
indigenization pursued by the Soviet Union. Same things were done in other Soviet republics. This involved promoting national languages and national cultures, which is not a bad in principle. That now, understand this. There's a, there's, a, there's a language called Ukrainian, but when you hear it, it sounds like Russian to me. What I'm saying is that these nations like Ukraine, former Soviet republics, they were given identities. They were bestowed upon a certain thing that they could latch themselves to, which became kind of dangerous. We'll talk about that a little bit more a little bit later. That is how the Soviet Ukraine was created. After the World War II, Ukraine received, in addition to the lands that had belonged to Poland before the war, part of the lands that had previously belonged to Hungary and Romania. So Romania and Hungary had some of their lands taken away and given to the Soviet Ukraine, and they still remain part of Ukraine. So in this sense, we have every reason to affirm that Ukraine is an artificial state that was shaped at Stalin's will. Now, the reason why that's important is because the whole point of this interview is to get some context about the Ukraine war. Why is Russia in Ukraine? Why did it happen? Who started it? Now, from what I saw in the interview, Putin's like, look, we didn't start the Ukraine war. They did. And it's a complicated reason why it started, which is why for the first half hour, he was given a history lesson on Kiev and Russ, uh, Ukraine, Russia, Lithuania, the Baltic states, Poland, even. He was talking about how all these places formed and their role and influence on that region of the world. That's very important to understand. And also, I like Vladimir Putin when he said from the very beginning, like, OK, are we going to have a real discussion? Because you're asking me questions to try and get me to stop making this introduction. Are we having the real discussion or are we on the podcast? Is it a show? Is it entertainment? What's going on? And this was a very serious discussion with a lot of good information. Now, let's keep on going. Somebody blew up Nord Stream 2 and anybody trying to take responsibility. Who blew up Nord Stream? <laughs> you for sure. I was busy that day. <laughs> Nate, it, do you have, do you have, <laughs> uh, I did not blow up Nord Stream. Uh, <laughs> thank you though. Maybe you have an alibi, you have an alibi. You personally may have an alibi, but the CIA has no such alibi. Did you have evidence that NATO or the CIA did it? You know, I won't get into details, but people always say in such cases, look for someone who is interested. But in this case, we should not only look for someone who is interested, but also for someone who has capabilities. Because there may be many people interested, but not all of them are capable of sinking to the bottom of the Baltic Sea and carrying out this explosion. Now, let's put a little bit of context here. So Nord Stream 2 is a pipeline that goes from St. Petersburg, Russia, through the Baltic Sea, uh, past the Baltic states that are right there. You got Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, um, etc. It goes through and also it goes like through the little strait right there. I think that's Estonia. And then Finland from St. Petersburg, Russia. So it goes through there, through the Baltic Sea into Germany, supplying Germany with energy. Now, somebody blew that up, which interrupted the flow, which is going to cost Russia billions of dollars. Now, some said that Vladimir Putin did it because he wanted to blame the West. Why would he do that when Russia needs the money? This is a big part of their economy. Why would they do that? Now, there was allegedly a U.S. destroyer spotted in the Baltic Sea at the time of the explosion. So motive, ability, and a little bit of physical evidence of seeing them right there when it happened. We could put two and two together and get four, but I digress. The president of Ukraine visited Canada. This story is well known, but being silenced in the Western countries. The Canadian parliament introduced a man who, as the speaker of the parliament said, fought against the Russians during the World War II. Well, who fought against the Russians during the World War II? Hitler and his accomplices. It turned out that this man served in the SS troops. He personally killed Russians, Poles and Jews. The SS troops consisted of Ukrainian nationalists who did this dirty work. The president of Ukraine stood up with the entire parliament of Canada and applauded this man. How can this be imagined?
The president of Ukraine himself, by the way, is a Jew by nationality. Very, very true. Now, let's let's go ahead and just skip to that. They asked um, Trudeau about this. They asked him just recently about this. Now, let's see what his response is. Uh, you've been such an ardent supporter of Ukraine, but there's been a lot of controversy surrounding President Zelensky's visit here. And now we've heard Vladimir Putin use some of that embarrassment in an interview with Tucker Carlson. How does it feel to know that that visit and your office's role in inviting uh, a, Nazi, a former Nazi uh, to a reception is creating hardship for an ally? Vladimir Putin chose to invade a neighboring sovereign country. That wasn't a question, sir. That was not the question. Now, this clip is about two minutes, 30 seconds long. He's right at a 28 second mark. The remainder of the two minutes, he's just filibustering, refusing to answer the question about them inviting a literal Nazi to parliament and giving them a standing ovation. That's what they did. Now, let's check this out. We have here in the chamber today, Ukrainian Canadians, Ukrainian Canadian world veteran from the Second World War who fought the Ukrainian independence against the Russians and continues to support the troops today, even at his age of 98. This guy was literally a Nazi. He, he literally, the guy that they're applauding, 98 years old, was literally a Nazi in the Waffen SS, deleting Jews, deleting Russians, deleting whoever they told him to delete. So we're talking about, oh, well, we got neo Nazis and these guys are bad and they shouldn't be celebrated. Then why is the Canadian Parliament celebrating this guy? But they want to say the Russians are the bad people. It's and and you have Nazis still to this day in the Donbass, which is where Russia and Ukraine are fighting. So what's really going on? There's a lot to this interview, and of course, you guys got to check it out. I'll link to it in the box. But as I close, I want to say this. This was an example of journalism, the way it should be done. Provide a platform. Don't go too hard into trying to just make it be, you know, uh, pressing, pressing, pressing. Ask honest questions. Don't give them a softball. Like, it can't just be the extremes. When talking about Zelensky, he's getting softball interviews at best. There's no hard questions. When you're talking about guys like Putin and others, a lot of times they get really hard questions with nothing that's anywhere in the center. No neutral, just straight up questions. No loaded questions. They get everything loaded. Everything's negative. Ask questions and get answers. Whether they lie or not, you have no way of being able to determine that. Not necessarily, unless you're able to fact check them right there in real time. But let that be up to us what we should and should not Listen to what we are and are not going to believe. And I think I'll leave that right there for now. And what said you? What's your take on the Tucker Carlson, Vladimir Putin interview? Did you enjoy it? Was it informative? Were you bored? Were you invigorated? Whatever your thoughts are, let me know in the comments below. You guys know where I'm at. This was a great interview. Very well done. Um, and I like how the tone was set from Putin. He was able to express himself and make himself be respected. Same as Tucker. Very well done. And we need more interviews like this and more interviewers like Tucker who aren't afraid to go against the grain of whatever the old school media, unit party, deep state, whatever they want to say. They're not afraid to go against them. I love it. And whatever your thoughts are, please let me know in the comments below. And that's all I got to say for this video. If you like what you heard, please comment, rate, share, and subscribe. Peace.